regular city council meeting for December 17, 2019 is now in session. We'll start with a roll call. We'll call to order, I'm sorry. Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, John. Okay. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call. So, Mr. Mayor, Here. I still need a moment. Oh, okay, no problem. We're not going anywhere in a hurry. Can you hear me? Testing one, two. <laughs> oh, mine, mine works. Can we go ahead and, I already told you, but I gotta tell Dan. Yeah, tell Dan. Dan, we're gonna make a change on the agenda. We're gonna have 2A, it's going to be uh, honor the Christmas Parade volunteers. It's 2A, it's AC becomes 2A, and 5A becomes 2B. This as number one. Mr. Mayor, I'm ready now. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Roll call. And it's five Mayor Flores? Here. Vice Mayor Edge? Here. And then here Council Member Freeze? Here. Council Member Freeman? Here. Council Member Jordan? Here. A quorum is present. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a change in the agenda. We are moving uh, 2C to 2A and 5A to 2B. So that's the first item is the honor of the Christmas Parade volunteers. And I have a list, but I need glasses now. <laughs> I got 2020 vision, but I need glasses now. This is a thank you to all the clubs and organizations and numerous individuals that volunteered with the Holiday of Lights Parade, the Holiday Lighting Downtown, bring the Holiday Spirit to our community. Rotary Club of San Juan Batista, San Juan Batista Community Business Association, San Juan Batista CBA Hospitality Committee, San Benito Gives, San Juan Batista Historic Downtown Merchants, San Juan Batista Service Club in Santa, Santa San Juan Batista Carl Luck Library, San Juan Batista Historical Society, San Diego County Sheriff's Department, City Code Enforcement, Rich Brown, City of San Juan Batista Public Works, City of San Juan Batista Staff and Management, San Juan Batista Strat Strategic Plan Committee, SJB 150, San Juan Batista Fire Department, E. Clampus Vitus, San Juan Batista State Park, Plaza History Association, San Juan School, Ansar High School, Old Mission San Juan Bautista, El Teatro Campesino, Project Art, SJB, the Mandalas of the Season, One Earth, One People, Peace Vision, and the support of the whole community. And it was uh, a lot of people were involved to make this really a successful event. So, that's it. No, no action needed on that. And our, our next item, which moves up, is a, a proclamation honoring Luis Valdez. And that is uh, 5A. Five, 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 <laughs> I will read that. Bless you. Bless your bones. <laughs> okay, here, here's the proclamation. Here? No, he's not here, I don't think. No, I don't see him anywhere. I don't either. No, we're going to read it anyway. I don't know if we were invi if we invited him or not. Did we? I don't believe so. I don't it's, it's, for, it's technically for an event in January, so. Yeah, he'll, he'll receive it. He'll receive it at the event. He'll get it when, when it's being presented. Yeah, this is being presented uh, in conjunction with a lifetime lifetime achievement award given to him by the uh, <coughs> Martin Luther King Breakfast. 
and it's from out of Bethany Church of God in Gilroy. So they're going to give him a Lifetime Achievement Award, and they asked us to do a proclamation. So here it is. Whereas Luis Valdez is regarded as one of the most important and influential American playwrights living today, and whereas Luis's numerous film and television credits include, among others, the box office hit film La Bamba, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, Cisco Kid, starring Jamie Smith, Teach My Dean, and Corrido Sales of Patrick and Revolution, starring Linda Ronstead. Uh, shoot, they didn't put suit suit oh. with J Edward James Olmos. It's a draft, we can amend it. We can amend it, okay, yeah. <laughs> Add, yeah. <laughs> Edward James Olmos, from, and he started in suit suit. Okay, so amended. Okay. <coughs> right. Yes, you do. The good thing I know of him. <clears throat> see where. Whereas Luis Company, El Teatro Campesino, located in the rural community of San Juan Bautista, is the most important and longest running Chicano theater in the United States, and whereas El Teatro Campesino has brought numerous plays to San Juan Bautista and to the Mission San Juan Bautista, and whereas Luis's hard work and long creative career have won him countless awards, including numerous LA Drama Critic Awards, Drama Log Awards, Bay Area, Bay Area Critics Awards, the prestigious George Peabody Award for Excellence in Television, the Presidential Medal of the Arts, the Governor's Award of the California Arts Council, and Mexico's prestigious Aguila Azteca Award given to individuals whose work promotes cultural excellence and exchange between the U.S. and Mexico. And whereas in May 2017, Luis Valdez was awarded the Tower Award by San Jose State University, the university's highest award given to San Jose State Exemplars, and whereas Luis Valdez has taught at the University of California, Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, Fresno State University, and was one of the founding professors of CSU Monterey Bay. And whereas Luis Valdez is the recipient of honorary doctors from the University of Rhode Island, University of South Florida, Cal Arts, University of Santa Clara, and his alma mater, San Jose State University. And whereas on January 20th, this is 17th. Luis Valdez will receive a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Martin Luther King Breakfast at Bethany Church of God in Gilroy. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city, for the, the city Council for the City of San Juan Bautista does hereby recognize Luis Valdez for his contribution to the arts, its exceptional performances, and for bringing El Teatro Campesino to the City of San Juan Bautista. Signed, Mayor Cesar E. Flores. There it is. Action on that? Yeah. No. We're good. No. There's a motion to approve that. It's a, it's a proclamation. It's a proclamation. So. There's no action. Either. Proclamation from whom? From the city. City council? Yeah, so does the, the city council need to say yes or no to that? Uh, no, not usually. <laughs> not usually. <laughs> we can. We, the the chair of the team of motion? I uh, will we'll just point it over. Um, how does, a, how does a proclamation come about? Doesn't the city council have to say, yes, I, I agree with that proclamation? I, I wholeheartedly mm -hmm. agree with this proclamation, but just point of order. Don't we need to all say, yes, we agree with that? Or can the city, or can the city administration and the mayor just say, yeah, we would issue this proclamation without the rest of the council saying we agree with that? That's the case here. I, yeah, I, was, I mean, that's always been the case. Is what? Not, What's the case? That the mayor, the mayor or the city manager can put an item on the agenda as a proclamation. Without the, the Without council. anyone else saying yes or no? <coughs> yes. Well, I think it'd be more meaningful to, to Luis if the entire council said yes, absolutely. No problem. We could change. We could do it. Yes. No problem. I and then it's one of the resolution. That would be. Um, Approve this proclamation for Luis Valdez. I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and second. Any more discussion? All in favor, stand by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you all. It's well deserving. You know, uh, I've known Luis for over 40, well, almost 50 years. Over 50 years. Uh, 
1974, my wife and I got married on the pyramids in Papanta Veracruz. We had an actual Aztec wedding. And Luis and his wife were our, our padrinos, their best man and maid of honor. So, I mean, we're like family. So, and anybody that's been around the teatro feels like it's family. So that's that's what the feeling is. But thank you. I, you know, on behalf of the teatro, me being a longtime member, uh, it's something that was a long time coming. So, yay! Thank you. Very good. So now. Uh, our next item on the agenda is selection of a new mayor. I'd like to make a motion to elect Vice Mayor Mary Edge as our new mayor. Okay. Do we have a second for that? I'd like to make a motion that John Freeman be mayor. Okay. We have, we have two. Oh, we, John have to, and we have to vote on the first motion first, I believe. We need a second for both of them. And as a chair, I only vote in uh, ties, right? No, you vote. I get a vote? So we got two motions. You we, have to and vote on neither the one has a second. We have to, sec we we have need to a second, second for the first motion, motion first. OK, we need a second for, for Mary Edge uh, nomination. I guess I get seconded. OK, so. And the second one is for John. Do we have a second for John? Come on, guys. I'll second it. You okay? <laughs> you can second yourself, sure. Okay, we have John and Mary. Any other nominations? We close the nominations. And now we go to the vote. The first vote would be the first, uh, it would be Mary. All in favor, respond by aye for Mary. Can I vote for myself? I think you need to go a roll call vote because okay. of the nature of this. It's really All right, let's do a roll call vote for both, both of these. Councilmember DeVries? No. Councilmember Freeman? No. Councilmember Jordan? Yes. Councilmember Edge? Yes. Mayor Flores? Yes. All members of the council being present, the motion as stated by the maker passes three to two with council members DeVries and Freeman voting no. Which obviates the need for the second motion. Yeah. I withdraw my withdraw my whatever. Likewise. Okay. The second one withdrawn, so Mary Edge is our new mayor. Do we change now or wait till we do the uh, the vice mayor as well? Yeah, we would change now. The mayor would preside. Yes. Change now. Change yeah. now. Yeah. That's it. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Mayor Flores. You're welcome. I'd like to thank the public that's here and everybody else for the support for the last year. It's uh, been a very productive year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's our town. And that's the beauty about it. So now we go on to uh, the selection of the new vice mayor. I make a motion that John Freeman be appointed vice mayor of the city of San Francisco. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Thank you. Okay. 
I would like to nominate uh, Leslie Jordan as vice mayor. I'll second it. <laughs> so now we vote for Roll call. So the first motion was um, John Freeman mm -hmm. as vice mayor. Councilmember DeVries? Yes. Councilmember Freeman? Yes. Councilmember Jordan? No. Councilmember Edge? No. Councilmember Flores? No. All members of the council being present, the motion as stated by the makers fails two to three with council members Jordan, Edge, and Flores voting no. So we do the second one. Yes. So the second motion was council member Jordan as vice mayor. Mm -hmm. Council member DeVries? No. Council Member Freeman? No. Council Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Edge? Yes. Council Member Flores? Yes. All members of the council being present, the motion as stated by the maker passes three to two with council members DeVries and Freeman voting no. Thank you. Back at you. Okay. All right. So we move on um, to uh, item number three, public comment. I have no cards on the desk. Okay. Consent items. All matters listed under the consent item, a consent agent agenda may be enacted by one motion authorizing actions indicated for those items so designated. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless requested by a member of the city council, a staff member, or a citizen. So um, do, we, do I have a, a motion to accept these items? I'll move one? it. So we have a... I'll check it. Okay. So... Um, John Freeman uh, uh, made a motion and um, says our second. Um, do we vote on it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so all those in favor, respond by aye. saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Okay, so item number five presentations, informal items, and reports. So um, we go to item B, and that's presentation of the fiscal year 2019 audit. Ryan Jolly, CPA. Congratulations, Mayor, and uh, thank you other council members for having me here tonight um, to present the audit for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2019. I just have a few comments and then I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Um, once again, we issued an unqualified opinion on the financial statements of the City of San Juan Batista. This is the audit opinion just following the table of contents. This is basically stating that we found the city's uh, financial records to be in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. <coughs> And so there were no exceptions to the, uh, to the, to the <coughs> opinion this year. 
um, going on is um, the first two financial statements, pages three and four, are the whole city combined, and this is on a full accrual basis. So the main difference between these statements and the, the fund financial statements that follow is that we record the capital assets of the city on, on these financial statements. And so this gives a, a total picture of with all the assets and liabilities of the city between the governmental activities and the business type activities, and that's on page three. I wanted to just point out on page five, this is the more of on a modified accrual basis. Um, the general fund is usually um, the fund that gets the most attention by the city. And you'll notice um, at the end of fiscal year, June 30, 19, the city had a total fund balance of almost 4.7 million um, in the general fund. If you look at page seven, you'll see your basically your profit and loss for the year. This shows the, the revenues and expenses that occurred in the general fund. This also shows the impact fees fund. This is what we call the two major funds of the city. It's based on the amount of activity that is occurring in these funds. Um, and because of the development that's been going on in the city, the, the impact fees is, is qualifies as a major fund as well. Um, but you'll see there are the revenues that were collected, um, the expenses, and uh, this year, um, the city had a decrease in fund balance of 167,000. So bringing, as I mentioned before, the ending fund balance to just under 4.7 million. City still has a strong, um, you know, general fund fund balance. As you know, there's been a lot of impact fees and permits and different fees collected by the city for the developments. There's been a little bit of a timing difference between last year and this year with the collection and the expenditures of those fees. So, um, so that's where, you know, it's a little bit, even though there's a loss this year, we had a pretty good surplus the year before and we're gonna still have some future expenditures as we, as we spend some of those fees going forward. Um, then I would like to just mention a little bit on the enterprise funds, starting on page nine. As you know, we've discussed in prior years, you know, the, inter the water and sewer fund have both, you know, carried a, they carry a significant amount of debt um, that was incurred years ago. In addition to that debt, there's, you know, the, the water and sewer funds had to borrow money from the general funds. So, that's now considered an advance because we've set up a payment schedule <coughs> back to the general fund with interest. And so those, both, both debts are being um, met, we're meeting the, the payment terms and we're making those payments. But um, just going forward, and the city's aware of this as future improvements are needed to be done to, the, to the, that infrastructure, you know, it's, it's gonna be probably imperative that the city looks at, you know, future rate increases or, or going after grants <coughs> that will allow the city to, um, you know, do those improvements without taking out additional debt. Um, I think at this point it'd be hard for the city to go out and issue bonds without, you know, doing a rate <coughs> increase, a, you know, significant rate increase. And I know that's something that's in the, you know, plans to do, you know, here soon is to do a, a rate study. So, um, so those two funds, like I say, they're, they're operating as intended right now. There's, they continue to meet the debt service coverage ratios. So we're in compliance with the covenants, but um, it's just something to keep in mind as the city plans for the future, you know, what, what additional work's gonna need to be done or major infrastructure projects may need to be done um, on those, on those two, uh, enterprise funds. Um, following the financial statements is basically the notes to the financial statements gives you a little bit more detail and some narratives on the, um, on the, on the different asset and liability accounts. Um, nothing out of the ordinary there. Just on page 25 is where we talk about some of the, um, the covenants that are in place for the bonds and, and um, and the different calculations that were made to show that we did meet those covenants this year. And you also see on page 25 the future um, debt service payments that are, um, as they come due, um, we're, we're going to be paying those up until 2044. Um, then lastly, well, not lastly, but on page 28 is kind of a um, budget comparison schedule. Um, for the most part, pretty pretty in line with budget. Um, 
as I mentioned, the capital outlay a little bit hard to, to budget for just because of the timing of some of the expenditures, but um, we're going to be work. I'm going to give Don some additional information as you guys do a mid-year budget review here to kind of, so you can see what categories we group things in for the financial statements. And there's always a little bit of a difference between how the budget looks and how the year and financial statements look. So it's a little bit of, you know, massaging the numbers to get them to, to you know, fit in their proper spots. But um, I'm going to give him a little more detail so he can kind of see how we group the numbers for the financial statements and then that will help as you go into the mid-year budget reviews. You can kind of do the same comparison with the, with, the, with the figures up through the first six months of this year. And then lastly, um, the non-major funds to follow there, those are all operating as intended. Nothing out of the ordinary with those. And then we'd lastly issue another audit opinion on the internal controls of the city. And um, this is where we are looking at any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in the internal controls. This would be in the kind of the main transaction classes we look at are cash disbursements, cash receipts, and payroll. And we're looking to make sure there's proper segregation of duties, um, that there's proper controls in place, that one person isn't doing too much of, the, of any one of those functions. And so this opinion here is stating that we didn't identify any deficiencies in your internal controls. Where's that statement? That's the last letter um, at the very end of the financial statement. 33. 32. 30, 32. Yeah, 32 and 33. Yeah, 32 and 33, yeah. Who is that opinion reviewable by? Um, IRS? No, no, no. Nobody. I mean, it's, yeah, you guys pretty much. If we had a finding, then we would we would make note of it in that letter and then there would be an additional schedule that listed out the, the conditions, the criteria, the recommendation to fix the, the findings. So, and then you guys would decide whether or not to take action on it. So. And then lastly is the management report to the city council. This is just kind of reiterating the, that previous opinion on the internal controls and then also us just letting you know that we didn't um, encounter any difficulties in the audit. Um, we didn't have any disagreements with management. Um, there were no material uncorrected misstatements that we identified. Um, we didn't have to consult with any other independent accountants. Um, just some general disclosures that we're required to make to you. So nothing, at, no exceptions to those comments either. So once again, a clean audit for the city. Um, uh, your staff always does a great job getting us what we need. Um, started working with Don this year on this year's audit and then worked with Wendy a little bit. Started earlier this year talking about just because of some of the, the different agreements with the developers and the skip funds and different things. We got ahead of that a little bit to kind of make sure we were booking those correctly and that made for, you know, smoother audit when we got here and at the end of November. So we were able to get a pretty quick turnaround this year once uh, <clears throat> because we got a little bit ahead of some of those some of those issues this year so so thank you for the opportunity to work with the city and I can answer any questions you have so, does anybody have a question I, I have a question Don you just heard all of that so the, <coughs> the, the bean counter says both and what do you say um, I had a chance to look at some trends dating back to, to uh, 13 14 and they're interesting to look at and and that's why I need some guidance being my first crack at this. Um, back in uh, the, the, for example, taxes received in 1314 were less than a million dollars, and, and in 1819 were up to 1.4. So we've seen really good growth in the sales tax and property tax and other general use, about 31% overall in the six year spread. Um, to offset that, the cost of general government has gone up 32%, but that's a much lower number. That's $460,000. So, so there's plenty of wiggle room there, as, 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 as uh, Mr. Jolly indicated. Um, I'm going to look at these trends and, and present them to you. Uh, it's important for the council to realize that both of our developments are endeavoring to pull all their building permits by December 31st. So pretty soon the revenues received in terms of impact fees and other things will come to a trickle. It'll, it'll, so so there's, you, we're going to see a dip this year, but that's okay because those impact fees are being turned into capital improvements. I've seen years where capital improvements were as low as 171, actually $17,000 in capital improvements in FY15-16. 
and, and we hope to be well over a million dollars this year, especially mm -hmm. with the Well 6 and Well 5 and the Third Street project coming on board. Um, so um, we're using those fees and they're going to good use. So um, yeah, I, I sounded out the, the call. Give me some general ideas. Mm -hmm. Randy, um, can we incur more debt? No. You know, so, so there are some important realities to, uh, to consider, and I'm still trying to digest it all. So it's a lot to swallow, I understand, Council. So if you have any other questions, we'll take a stab at it while Randy's here. Wow. So on the enterprise fund on page nine, we have total assets of uh, $3.5 million approximately, and uh, the liabilities are uh, 2.855 approximately. Um, so is the, the remainder, the 0.8 million, is that just for uh, operation? Where are you at here on page nine? Yeah, said? page nine. You're looking at um, total current assets. Oh, total current assets. Yeah, yeah that is uh, that's just your. And then you were saying your liabilities, current liabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you were to look at that, that would be more your like liquid, you know, um, cash that's available. Part of this cash though is restricted because of for the impact fees. We've collected impact fees in the water and sewer fund as well. So those aren't those can be used for capital improvements, but can't be used for you know regular operations. So. Um, and then you've got the advance in that, well, that actually, that's actually distorting it. That should be probably broken out. I should have that advance broken out between long-term and short-term. So, um, I just noticed that that 1.7 million is not all due in the next fiscal year. So there's a 20 year amortization schedule for that now. So the, that's for the big loan we took back in 2008 or nine or whenever it was. Or, yeah. 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 The from the bond general bond or whatever it yeah. was here. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Go on to item C, report by the fire department. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is Bob Martin Del Campo. I'm the uh, Fire Chief for the cities of uh, San Juan Batista, Hollister, and San Bernardino County. Um, report I have for you today was uh, created December 9th. Um, the Hollister Fire Department responded to 239 calls um, at District 4, which is um, San Juan Batista proper, um, 101 corridor, and all the way down to uh, Mitchell Road. Um, we had, uh, of those uh, 239 calls, 39 of them were uh, what we call automatic aid responses to and from um, Aromas Tri-County Fire Protection District. Um, about, I want to say about six months ago, we established an automatic aid agreement with um, Aromas, Aromas Tri-County Fire Protection for the sole purpose of uh, reciprocal support in any large-scale disasters or even um, um, coverage. If they're running more than one call, we'll go in their district and help them out. And several times they have come to our district without us having to ask. They're part of the, what we call a run card. So it would be like our first alarm. I'm sure you've heard of that term before. So on a first alarm uh, assignment here, especially on uh, Church Street, the Church Street fire that we had a couple of uh, weeks back, they were the probably the second engine in, um, even though we had engines coming in from San, um, I'm sorry, from uh, Hollister. So you had a good response um, to suppress the fire and to provide support. And in that time, medical aids were coming. So was, instead of exhausting all resources on one fire, we were able to uh, sustain the continuity of service. And that's the whole purpose for it. Yes, sir. So you guys were first in on the Church Street fire? Yeah. And who was the second engine in? It was uh, Aromas Tri County because they're so close. Which comes from Carpenteria? Uh, y yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. That's mutual aid? What's that? And that's mutual aid agreement? Auto aid. Automatic uh, aid. Auto aid. So, yeah, go ahead. Same thing though, mutual aid, auto aid. Isn't no, it? no. So, auto aid is once you, you call 911, um, it, it'll pop up the type of call that you are calling for. In this case, it was a structure fire, and you need at least five engines on that fire. They are part of that initial response. If you call for mutual aid, that means our engine will go to the incident, 
see what's happening, and then make that request while they're on scene. So this auto, one, auto aid is they get toned out the same time you do. Exactly, that's okay. it. Better said. Okay. So if, if this, conversely, though, if there's a structure fire going on in Aromas yes. on Carpinteria, then you're going to get a tone out for that as well. Yes. So yes. San Juan engines going to Aromas. San Juan engines going to Aromas, and then a Hollister engine will be coming this direction. So what is the what is the uh, distinction of the auto aid agreement right now? Where does that exist? The the just, actual document it itself, or the outline, yeah. But is, is it just San Juan and Aromas? Yes, it is. It's just San Juan and Aromas, with the caveat of uh, Santa Clara, and I was just going to mention that also. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so, so to the north of the county, um, Santa Clara will be coming into our area in an auto aid agreement also, um, and it, at that fact, the the purpose we established this was for the sole fact of the 101 corridor. So because there's so many accidents coming in and out of the 101 corridor, if an incident happens there, you're going to have two pieces of apparatus addressing that incident, along with the battalion chief from Hollister. Um, at the same token, um, we will go into their area and they'll come to our area. For a long time, there was a gray area, okay? And, and, and when I say that, it was where 25 and um, 101 intersected. N nobody really knew whose responsibility it was. So we accepted that because we're a lot closer to it. And we're going to have to use that turnoff to get back to our area anyway. So we assume that responsibility knowing if we did that, they would come further into our area. So now we've got Cal Fire, um, South County, Santa Clara coming into our area. And we have um, uh, Aromas Tri-County coming into our area also. This is the first time in over 50 years that we've ever had any kind of collaboration like this. And it's reciprocal which means in short term, it's, it's, it's basically free. It's a free service that they're providing us and that we provide them also. That's good. So to, to continue on with the chief's report, like I said, 39 of those calls were um, in and out of the, the Aromas Tri-County area. District four, um, we had 13 fires, uh, 43 vehicle accidents, um, nine, 91 EMS calls, emergency service calls, and uh, 92 um, other calls, which are miscellaneous, public assist, alarm sounding, uh, gas leak, and hazmat. And a hazmat can be attributed to somebody spilling antifreeze on the road, an environmental protection agency. We've got to address that to try to mitigate that issue. I have a question. Yes, sir. On EMS, if you have a call for, uh, for medical aid, whatever, how many vehicles come up? So what happens for that, depending on the call, of course, if it's a, and they, they classify them from um, alpha to echo, echo being your worst case scenario, alpha could be um, like a lift assist. Somebody falls down, they can't get up on their own. We'll provide that support to get them. What you're gonna get there is usually um, the fire engine, if it gets there first, and then we'll usually try to cancel the, the ambulance so we can leave them free for service, or if it takes more than just an engine company, which is three people on your engine, um, will ask for additional support if, if, if the person actually needs it. Um, if it's an echo, it, it's, it's lack of consciousness, lack of um, respiratory system, and, and the heart might be stopped. And so two-person CPR actually takes three people and one person to drive. Um, so you'll, you'll get about two pieces of apparatus our captains will determine the amount of apparatus that's necessary to mitigate that incident. And um, it, it's the, me the medical aid is usually the ambulance and the engine. Th either one of those two authorities will either request more apparatus or they'll go ahead and release some so we can continue our service. I hope I didn't confuse you, but that, that's the gist of, of that right there. Um, I'm just asking because I had a couple of incidents in my neighborhood and yeah. all kinds of vehicles yeah, yeah. You'll you'll you hear the sirens, and and not until the incident is over, you'll you'll see you'll probably find out from what's going on why there was so much apparatus to it. Like a like a vehicle accident, for for instance, you'll get a a rescue apparatus, you'll get an engine, and you'll get the uh, medic. Plus, you'll get a battalion chief. So you're going to get four pieces of equipment, and maybe a total of between eleven to to fifteen people on it. Yeah, I do have to give. Uh compliments to to your workers there was a a fire outside somebody's home somebody put barbecue you know thing and, and it's caught on fire and it was on the outside but they came in and checked out all that and they also actually went into the attic 
of the house and checked out to make sure that everything was safe. Right. And I go, wow, that's right. pretty cool. The, the worst thing for us to happen is to go to an incident like that, extinguish the fire, and then have to come back because of a rekindle. That's the R word. It's worse than the F word. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Chief, uh, let's get back to auto aid and mutual aid. Sure. You, in your opinion, does the city of San Juan Batista today have the mutual aid and auto aid agreements in place that it needs to protect this town? I. Or is there something else we need to do there, as there, a city? There, there's always something else we could do. There's always a lot what of is improvement. That else we, what, else, what is that else we need to do? I, I would like to see a strategic plan for emergency services here. We're, now, now you got to understand, we live near five known fault lines. Um, and the canyon. And, and, and the canyon, yes. So I was going to get to the what we call the WUI. That's the, the wildland urban inter interface. And it's all around us. You, you will, the, city of, the city of San Juan Batista and the city of Hollister are an island surrounded by agriculture. Right. Okay. And, and because of that, it, it's beautiful. I love it. I moved here from San Jose. Uh, but I, I understand the threat that it imposes. And um, that's something that needs to be addressed also. So I just addressed two um, significant concerns that I feel would be able, we would need to mitigate with a, 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 a public safety plan, a strategic plan. And, and I say that because of the fact that if something does happen and we need to get any kind of federal reimbursement or um, Cal OES reimbursement, you gotta have that um, mitigating Factor. What did you do to try to prevent this? Right. Well, the strategic plan plans the way ahead. Right. And then with the strategic plan, we'll absolutely know you're going to need more than one ambulance in this location. You're going to need an identified landing zone, um, maybe even an additional engine coming out of um, the, the, the firehouse here. But until those mitigation plans are, are or the emergency operations plan, is developed, we we can only speculate, and and me and the city manager have been talking about this for a couple couple of months now. So, we're um, we're, we're we're well into that. To, to the chair, one last question. So, city manager, you're aware of these concerns. What we have to do? Yes. Um, have we tasked that? Have we kind of identified what needs to happen there? Like in terms of do we need a subcommittee? Do we need someone from the city to interface besides you? It's a lot to put on your shoulders. Right. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, um, I'm, I've, I've only um, had conversations. We haven't delved into the, the meat of what a strategic plan would look like. I just learned today, somewhat by accident, that in 2015 we became, we adopted the county's multifunctional hazard guide from 2015. So that is uh, a plan in and itself. But oftentimes we need to supplement that and localize it, which is what I'm hearing the strategic plan to be. I'm accustomed to a standard emergency management plan that we would adopt and, and hire a consultant to do. So that's what I did in the prior city where I worked in Ventura County, a new small city that didn't have police and didn't have fire, had a local coordinator, not the city manager, designated to handle emergencies. Um, and that was through El Nino floods and the Northridge earthquake and everything else they threw at us during that 10 year period. So those plans are vital. And one thing we learned in uh, Salinas after 2017 is that if you don't have your documentation right, and your photographs and your data, yeah. you're not getting any money from FEMA or the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. You just throw that money away. So it's really critical to have the plan up front, as you suggest, uh, Council Member. So that way, after the emergency occurs, you have the administration in place and the documentation to go yeah. and, and get reimbursed. Absolutely. But but uh, having to declare a, a state of emergency in, in the mayor's uh, a garage <laughs> at five in the morning uh, on, on Martin Luther King's birthday was pretty interesting. The city manager couldn't figure out how to get his garage door open. Oh, no. uh, anyway, <laughs> so we, we've been through, I've been I've been I've been through that before. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You're right. I was just gonna say that. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, I'm scared as hell for the San Juan Canyon. I've lived here for 30 years. And if that canyon burns with all this fuel that's going to come about with all this rain mm -hmm. in the springtime and the summer, there's only one way out. Yeah. I've been very, very terrified of those poor folks that live in the canyon. And we need to have a plan. And we need right. to start talking about that. Right. Right. Because then the feds are going to be, look, not just the feds, CNN is going to be interviewing you. Mm -hmm in the windmill parking lot, saying, what did you do, city manager? What did you do? Mm -hmm. 
So I think we have to be on the we have to be proactive. Oh, absolutely. And now we're in the winter months. It's raining like crazy, which is great. But now is maybe the time to start having those conversations. Because so, when, when it's too late, it's too late. It, well, it sounds to me as though you're talking about this. Oh yeah. There is something right. uh, that has started, and so I would encourage you to. Continue. Yeah, it, and it always it always continue. It always happens with um, um, uh, uh, discussions like this. When, um, for instance, the what the council member was bringing up about his concern with just the the, the low hanging fruit, the very visible um, items that that are tangible for you to understand. But in in at the same token, you'll see you'll start seeing some of the. Uh, um, the un the unintang the untangible um, items that are concerns because I don't live up there. But those who do, they 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 bring those concerns to us so we can better well address them. So like the fire safe council meeting, when when I have my battalion chiefs or when I attend them, there are things in there that we don't upfront recognize until the the process is brought to fruition, just like this. So the the conversations are happening. I know that they have a fuel mitigation program going on right now, which is a huge mitigating factor because the less fuel you'll have up and down from there, the, the better it is for them to make a, an escape route and then for us to go and uh, suppress fire. So yeah, absolutely. Who's got that going on? It's the Fire Safe Council. Okay. Yeah, if I may add to that, that's, I was told by the Fire Safe Council I attended last month, it's a, I believe it's a $5 million grant or something, maybe it's four, you know, but right. Uh, and it includes trimming, and it's done by a private contractor through CAL FIRE, as like the overseeing yes. people yeah. or whatever. And that includes up to possibly 500 feet from the road in, which is a huge distance oh, yeah. compared to what they usually do, which is like 20 or 30 feet in. And so that's reducing all the tree limbs, the overhanging tree limbs, all the brush on the ground. Mm -hmm. And the only worries is it'll look like the moon instead of San Juan Canyon because they're gonna remove, a, they have removed a lot of stuff. And it's tons of organic debris, trees, yeah. limbs, yeah. bushes, all that stuff. Um, and so there, there is a plan. They are, the Fire Safe Council is working on it. They've had practice evacuations this summer, twice. They end up at the bar at, uh, San Juan, San Juan Oaks. Oaks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the command post. So that should be part of the plan. They should yeah. be buying local. Uh -huh. But is that with the secondary access that comes out of the canyon? Yeah. There is yes, a secondary yes, it access is, yeah. on, it is. on yeah. the Fremont Peak yeah. Road. Because yeah. yeah. that's what I was going to say. We need evacuation points uh -huh. on the canyon. Uh -huh. Right. And we need ways out. Because if that thing goes up, it's going to go up like a freaking Roman candle. Yeah. And, and, and to I mean, the point of... People are going to need a way out. And, and to the point that we were making, um, the more tangible um, and visible items we, we know is, is the main paved road, but those underlying um, items that we have, like that backup e escape route, w w you only know about it by living out there, and they know that they can get to um, the, the command post at San Juan Oaks. Right. So it's, it's, it's those items that we need to um, have published in, in a strategic plan, especially for an evacuation area like that. I, I would hate to have that be another Sutter county incident like we had up north where uh, a lot of those folks up there were over the age of 63 because that was a retirement facility one way in that was it that was it yeah. that's what we have here and that's what we have here yeah, yeah. so, so whatever okay. we can do as a city absolutely let us know absolutely yeah. thank you for that thank you for that I'll, so I'll go I, ahead and I, had one, I had one more question on yes. the structure fire at 34 church street yes. um I, I just wanted to compliment you guys on the response. I thought it was great. Uh, I, I live maybe a block and a half from there, and you know the structure's still standing. You sit, literally saved the house, and they had to tear out the drywall and stuff like that. But that's to be expected. Yeah. Um, so, but I also heard that there was another severe—not severe—serious um, um, fire in Hollister at, at almost the same time. And so I was wondering if you guys were okay because. I still saw a lot of trucks around that 34 yeah. Church Street, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so when when that did happen, um, that's that's what we call call queuing, and I'll call queuing means it's a fancy word for two two incidents at one time. Um, the city of Hollister was not left unattended. Uh -huh. um, we were even to pull um, resources in from South Santa Clara County at the Bell Station at Pacheco Pass, so they were able to support us 
And we, if I'm not mistaken, got, we, we received some support from the Fairview station where their, their apparatus came into our area and our apparatus was free because of the familiar, familiarity of our area knowledge and we were able to do the medical aids while they were working both of those fires. Uh -huh. So that, that's the whole um, bump and cover concept and, and continuity of service. R really important in this day and age and especially if, if you're in a, an environment like this, like I said, we're two um, islands surrounded by agriculture where if you're in Mountain View, you got Sunnyvale, Palo Alto, San Jose, Santa Clara all around you within minutes. My next closest engine outside of um, San Juan Batista is Gilroy, and that's 20 minutes on a good day, mm -hmm. yeah. on a good day. And, and fire doubles in two minutes. So I take those into consideration. I'm going to go ahead and continue yeah. with the, uh, the chief's report. I got one more item, and it's a fire prevention investigation. So the engine company did uh, its annual inspections with, uh, with the local businesses. Um, we've got the school inspections completed. The hotel inspections um, are, are complete as of this week. Weed abatement is ongoing. And of course, we had mentioned the, the structure fire on, on Church Street. That concludes my uh, fire report pending your uh, questions. <laughs> so I think we've yes, already, you already asked it, but I do have one. And, and I, I did talk to our city manager about it. But um, the entrance of uh, on the Alameda, Yes. On the right-hand side, the old brewery that was remodeled. Yes. That I feel like going and pulling those weeds myself. <laughs> I, I just, it, that bothers me to see it like that. And it's the, the, old, the old, do we have an address on that? I don't um, know. Before J.J.'s Burgers. No, it's oh, not okay. my head. Right. Uh, yeah, it's on the right-hand side, yeah. just yeah. before you get to J.J.'s yeah. Burgers. So I, I followed up to Mayor's concerns. We are on our second code enforcement notice in regards to that. So a code enforcement started in October, and he sent a second notice, and so we have to let that expire. There's a whole administrative process. Well, I, I think they might have gotten a notice before that, too. Okay. Correct. Right. Yeah. This so this, this, yeah. So. All right. Okay. And okay. One more, yes. One more question. I, and no, no, you. I have a question for you. A comment. Oh, for me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, comment first. Uh, thank you very much for the use of uh, your staff uh, helping with their transfer of the old engine. Oh, yeah, right. The, uh, Guatemala. Yes. Yeah, that was awesome. Cool. Uh, Good. Thank you. It was pretty incredible. Uh, great photos of that. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Good. Uh, and You're I welcome. have a question for uh, the city, Don. Um, how did the water system do with the fire on Church Street? I wasn't aware of any issues at all. Yeah. Um, I didn't hear any. But I'm just that. curious on how the water system. Yeah, no, uh, no issues at all. Um, the mayor asked me to look into the four-inch, uh, uh, the four-inch fire hydrants, and and I have yet. I need to follow up with Charlie and the, the, the okay. fire marshal on that, right. and see if we can get that into a plan. We're working on our water master plan, as you know, and, and that would be an important part of it. Oh, yeah. Great. All right. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. That worked. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chief. So. Um, now we go on to the monthly fi financial statements, D. The report before you is uh, exactly uh, a third of our year, and you'll see that most of our expenses are right at 33%. Um, so we're holding the line and doing well. As noted in previous reports, the uh, affordable housing fund is uh, extraordinarily high. I found that we have $140,000 in, in, uh, in a reserve fund and we can adjust that at, at the mid-year budget adjustments in January and bring that into line. Of course, that's all because the housing element discovered more issues than just the housing element when we looked into it, and so we've incurred some additional expenses there. So otherwise, um, everything is, is pretty cop copacetic. I'm glad to see the, uh, the capital improvements are up there. Um, that's a good thing, and the rest of it seems to be in line. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to respond to that. Anybody have questions? Okay, good. Thank you. And now we go on to our uh, city manager's report. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of the city council, just real quick, because it's all written there before you. Um, uh, we've done a lot uh, trying to reorganize our staffing. We uh, greatly miss our office assistant. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, we do hope to get more checks printed this year. I don't know about money, but we'll print some checks. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank you, Laura, for your dedication and service. Um, we're also can, we, can we pause right there? Sure. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Sincerely. Miss you, Laura. You were, you were a welcoming <laughs> addition to the city. Thank you. And I'll say that you raised the bar. Thank you. Would you use that, Mr. Manager? Absolutely. Well, I've only been here three yeah, months. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. It was Laura. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. You did? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Hard to live up to. Um, uh, we will be closed uh, during the week of December 23rd to the 27th. We will have minimal staffing at the yard to make sure that our water and sewer systems are, are, are running as planned, and the library will have limited hours. Uh, we just reviewed our audits, and soon I'll be coming in January with a mid-year budget amendment. Um, some special projects I've identified in there. Maybe um, one will be... Uh, uh, preparing for emergencies and, and preparing that strategic plan. I'll add that to my list. Um, there is uh, a process that the International City Managers uh, Association recommends called ClearGov, and it creates an open data portal into your finances and provides the status of all of your expenses and revenues to make government more transparent to the general public. We've had a proposal from them I, I look forward to sharing in January with the council uh, around open data. And then uh, there's also a proposal I have in my office uh, from uh, a group that can do a sustainability uh, study of our city and, and look out five and ten years into the future to see if we're generating enough revenue in lieu of our liability. So it takes the audit and expands it out to a ten-year projection so that we avoid making catastrophic mistakes now that may impact us in the future, like incurring debt. So those are two special studies I want to follow through on. On cannabis, um, we have a discussion item tonight, and we have another item tonight to uh, clean up our, our codes. Um, I've done some homework and uh, I'm ready to present that under item 8A tonight, so I won't uh, uh, discuss that in too much detail, but we are making progress on our cannabis uh, program. Um, the SB2 grant for planning was submitted um, November 30th, looking at a strategic uh, plan, uh, what we refer to as the Alameda Corridor and the properties adjacent to that. Um, I met with some of the city council members about that project. It could be pretty cool as it comes together. Um, uh, Public Works, uh, we went back and reclaimed $116,000 of the RSTP funds uh, from COG this month. That was something that uh, was to be uh, recouped in 2018. So we're, we're tightening all, up, all of our uh, uh, capital improvements up and making sure our, our funding is in place. Um, we have the Pavement Management Plan uh, Award is ready to go. Uh, we have a, a good low bid on that, substantially lower than budgeted, so that's a good news moving forward on that. That's required for Measure G. Um, it should Don, take how, about how six long weeks. will the engineering firm take to complete that task it's, once it's, it's been awarded? It's estimated to take only six weeks, which is a relief. Okay. Um, in, in a larger city, it takes a lot more time. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> um, well, we know where it's bad, here, so we'll be able to assess that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, hopefully. Really Pardon loud. me. Um, we made it through some heavy rains, and, and uh, my hat's off to our public works crew who are out there in the midst of it, uh, clearing leaves and, and making sure our storm drains were cleared. We had a few minor uh, areas of flooding, and we're addressing those now. Um, um, the street sweeper, unfortunately, is having problems with its uh, aftermarket smog uh, reduction uh, equipment, so we hope to have that in line next week. We just bought some more parts for it. Um, I made some progress on the Franklin Circle Park this week. Um, we don't own that property. And that's, um, well, it was dedicated uh, in 1961 when the track map was adopted. So I came across a, a company, Hammer Jewel, uh, that we worked with in, in another agency. And they're going to uh, describe a process for us and create an APN and, and get that into our park system. So I've been in touch with some of the community members there to let them know, reassure them that we haven't forgotten them. Uh, on the Franklin Park. Well, you can ask Chuck right there. So you're, is that okay if I interrupt? Yes, yes, please. Okay. So Franklin Circle, no one knew who owned it. Apparently, no one still knows who owns it. Apparently it was dedicated as roadway. So. But it's not a roadway, it's a little yeah. particular thing. So we have that a people process. People have been clamoring to do something with forever. And, and so what your idea is, the, maybe, uh, maybe you guys are up to speed on this, I'm not. So your idea is to have that be defined as a 
parcel had been transferred to the city of San Juan Bautista? Right, it's right now it's a As roadway, a so, so it's unclear. If it's a roadway right away, are there different things you can do with it, so I would like it to become a parcel so that we can develop it as part of our park system. And, yeah. and the community has donated money, has come up with a design. We have all those things so in place. So that's with the grant tour of that be on that date. I think with the grant TV. The grant TV would be the city of Southeast So I thought it came about through a subdivision map. Yes, it did. And, and so it was the developer. And you know, if it was, were, to, were to go back, the developer is probably not around. So, so it probably is a quiet title action is what's going to have to right. be done. Right. And it's something filed in the courts to quiet title quiet, on the property. Quiet title in favor of the city of San Juan Batista. Right. So the city would therefore then own that? Right. And you're saying we would incorporate that into our parks plan or something? Right. I think that'd be awesome. So, so we, 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 we cracked the, the, the puzzle and, and moving forward yeah. on that. Um, and last but not least, I'm, I'm, I'm joining Rotary Thursday, assuming I can get up at 7 in the morning and join them for breakfast. The mayor is, the, the, uh, the assessor, council member Flores has sponsored me in that regard, so. Um, I'll probably have more to report next month. Scrambled eggs. <laughs> it's it did leave uh, something out. Oh, it's a good time. Address is uh, the old fire engine. Mm -hmm. We didn't mention it, but we did get it out to San Benito, El Petén, Guatemala. So, I mean, we had no use for it. It was obsolete. We can't even write in it because the back is open, so, and they can use it. They don't have it. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a city that almost doubled its population from 30,000 to 55,000 and has no fire engines and a 100% volunteer fire department. So they can use it. Go volunteers. Yeah. The Go process volunteers. is this <laughs> guy from Boston has got this program. It's, uh, he, was, he was from New Jersey. Fortheworld.org. For for yeah, for He's from New Jersey wearing a Boston here. house and, uh, <laughs> shirt. The fire engine will go from here to Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. will be loaded on an airplane at, at uh, Travis and taken to Guatemala City. Yes, and from Guatemala City, it will be driven down to, to San Benito. Which is a town located right next door to? Oh, the uh, state next door, <laughs> the capital is Flores. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's good. All right. She, okay. she paused for you to be able to say that. I did, yeah. <laughs> I did. Okay. good segue, good segue. Okay. I, I do have a couple of questions, if I may. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, on the cannabis, uh, last line, it says laws regarding water conservation and groundwater contamination already exist and do not need to be duplicated in the code. We're not duplicating. We're referring to them, though, correct? Right. And so the <laughs> handout uh, on item 8A shows, a, a, I think, a good example uh -huh. of doing that. So I, I just I bypassed that so we could discuss it in more detail under that discussion. I just, yeah, thanks for the clarification on that. The other one is on the public works crew. Uh, again, the last line, odors from earthbound farms seem to, seems to have decreased as a result of intensifying the use of chemical treatments. Um, what are those chemical? Earthbound is actually doing those chemical treatments. No, that's our assumption of managing the coke uh, lift station. Okay. And um, I could look back in my notes because I'm not a chemist, but it's something to uh, uh, adjust the sulfur so that the sulfur smells not as strong. And initially, we started with s small doses, and mm -hmm. now we've doubled that and even tripled it. And we're testing the water weekly to make sure that we're adding enough, but not too much, because that sets our whole treatment plan off. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're not killing the good bugs in the plant. Well, I'm, right. I'm going to tell you firsthand, the odor comes into my house, and you can't get it out. It's outside, it's mm -hmm. in the house, and it's oh. disgusting. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, very bad. That he's Absolutely, that. very bad. So we're trying to say as the entrance way to the city. I just want to make sure it's not going to kill our our plan. Yeah, no, we're working with our operator on that. Thank you. Oh, and, and also I wanted to throw in one more thing. I, last Friday I sent to you our response to the EPA, the four-page letter that I'm <laughs> sure you all enjoyed reading. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's a pretty complicated plan, and it's interesting to see what had been done in the past. It's a legacy from 2009 trying to fix our water, so we have a, a monumental task ahead of us still. So, anyway. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we move on to reports from city council appointees to regional orga organizations and committees. The only board I have is on uh, <coughs> La, uh, La Corona meeting. Yeah, the council. We're working on the, you know, uh, 
turnaround, turnaround, turnaround. Oh, yeah. The yeah, roundabout. Yeah, 23 years. I was there by one of the Yeah. But the guy didn't read it. We did send a, a letter uh, from COG saying that we're not in the group. Support it. We don't support it, and we also got uh, several communications from another group, which includes Mike Graves and Steve Rosati. And they've got, I mean, they've actually <coughs> offered up different, you know, alternative plans to go in place. So we're really worried about it. Uh, they're going to build this monstrosity there for $10 million, and in 10 years, they're going to tear it down to match it with. With the extension of the of the of uh, 25, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. It's been ten million dollars, and then ten years later we got to tear it down. You know, why don't we just take that money, you know, build a flyover or something, you know, that'll work, and it won't cost as much. But that's what we're fighting. Mm -hmm. Dan, do you have anything? No. John. So AMBAG did not meet in December. Uh, they take the month off. Um, intergovernmental did meet, and uh, after uh, <clears throat> many, many months of, of, of discussing the same item over and over and over and over and over and over again, and if I didn't say it enough, and over again, um, <laughs> um, I finally made the, the suggestion that it's that their issue is a planning issue and that they just have the planning department talk to the facilities director of Hollister Unified School, or Hollister School District. And they go, oh. And so I said, oh, just do it. And uh, then I said to myself afterwards, why didn't I say that three months or four months ago <laughs> <laughs> to avoid all this, but that's the way they are, you know, so. Monterey Power did meet, and we have a lot to talk about. This is not a presentation, Don. There's no bells, whistles, or slides. <laughs> Thank okay? you, Council Member. Uh, or videos. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. But uh, um, so, first of all, some people are asking, what does Monterey Bay Community Power do? And so, what they do is they buy clean, what we call clean power, which means CO2 free, and that's defined as not from a combustion process, which would be a boiler fueled by coal, natural gas, sawdust, any number of things that could be used to, to power a boiler. Um, it instead comes from wind, solar, batteries, uh, tidal, many, uh, and, and of course hydroelectric. So that's what they do is they buy clean power and they resell it to us, the retail customers. And that's how they do it. And then, and the way that has come about is because the power industry 30 or 40 years ago was a vertically integrated industry, which means PG&E generated the power, transmitted the power, sold the power, and we used it. And that, and that was it. It was very simple, and that was it. But, for example, I'll use the Moss Landing power plant. For example, 1998, the PUC made PG&E sell that plant after they'd owned it for over 25 years. They sold it to Duke Energy of... Virginia or someplace like that. <coughs> and um, <laughs> you know that. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway um, and Duke Energy sold it to Dynagy and so forth and so forth. And it doesn't really matter because they sell the power back to PG&E, not to Monterey Bay Power because they use natural gas, uh, and so forth. So that's an example of why you can buy and sell power on the open market freely, and it's done by many different vendors. Okay, so. And we just pick vendors who produce CO2 free power. And so that's what Monterey Bay Community Power does. And we had $228 million in revenue last year. We rebated $4.4 million to customers, including all our customers in San Juan Batista. The company completely paid off $6.2 million of startup debt and now has $94 million in reserves. So that's, wow. yeah, a lot. That's a lot, and that was all done in a year and a half, okay? Um, uh, a, a lot of organizations, governmental organizations, such as cities and counties, have what's called a sustainability plan. Uh, it's going to be required in a few years. I might suggest that we work with the county 
and maybe the city of Hollister and getting one also for our area because access is going to be required in a few years. So these, a big part of these sustainability plans is to buy or to give the city power that is CO2 free. Uh, and that's what drove the city of, of San Luis Obispo to join Mon and, and Morro Bay to join Monterey Bay Community Power. And they did that about nine months ago and, that, and they're now receiving uh, our power. Uh, so the other cities in that area also kind of said, well, we ought to do that too. And so they just joined last month. And the other cities in the area, I know it's kind of long and boring, but there are Arroyo Grande, Paso Robles, Pismo Beach, Grover Beach. And in Santa Barbara County, the cities are Carpinteria, Goleta, Guadalupe, and Santa Maria, and the county of Santa Barbara. The city of Santa Barbara is going to go its own way. And so that's <laughs> somewhat interesting. Um, that's interesting. So now, uh, and these organizations, like Monterey Bay Community Power, are often called CCEs, Community Choice Energy. And we now stretch from the Oregon border to oh, the nice. Mexican border on the coastline. Inland, we don't have a lot of presence. But we now have a third of all electrical customers, about 11 million electrical customers. Um, the other third is done by what's called municipal utilities, such as Sac Sacramento Municipal SMUD, Sacramento mm -hmm. SMUD. And LA Power and Light is another municipal, and they, they all have another 11 million. And the last 11 million is done by what's called the IOUs, which is investor owned utilities PG&E, San Diego Gas and Electric, so SoCal Edison, et cetera. So <coughs> CCEs can only operate in an investor owned environment, they cannot infringe upon a municipal utility. Um, just a little bit of information. So the other thing that we have done in, in, um, in this tri-county area is we have saved or stopped from entering into the atmosphere 300 million metric tons of CO2 by, by using our, our energy. So that's, what, that's the whole purpose. Plus we save this year, it'll be 5% off of your power costs for the generation costs. Okay, so we still pay PG&E for the distribution costs, because they are still the distributor, and will be. Um, but the savings this year, which I think was on this month's bill, uh, will be 5% of, of your total bill. Next year, uh, we're going to go, we always match pg needs rates and gave you a 5% discount. We're going to move away from that model, and we're going to set our own rate schedule. And it's going to be anywhere between 5 to 10% lower than pg and mm -hmm. depending on what category you're in, if you're a commercial or industrial or residential customer. So it'll vary. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's, 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 a, that's, that's about, about that's the idea. Yeah. Thank you, John. <laughs> I've got here. <coughs> that's uh, San Benito County Water. Um, a reminder to turn off sprinklers. It's raining. Oh my gosh. People still have them on. Uh, that's about it. And uh, I went to the 40th anniversary of the area um, agency for the aging. And um, there's a lot of baby boomers becoming seniors. Um, there's a lot of lack of funding. We need funding. We're still, I guess the, the money that they're receiving is uh, still from the 1980s. Um, and so there's not an, enough funds. We need to be more aware of seniors. Uh, one of the goals that they are having is um, making an, a master plan for aging, uh, trying to come up with ways to helping uh, preventing uh, falls and, and just have uh, age-friendly communities. And um, uh, Jovenes de, de Antaño uh, opened up 40 years ago and Pauline Valdivia is still there and she... Oh my. Yeah, and so she's still there. So that's it for me. So uh, now we go on to uh, strategic plan 
committee report? Um, good evening. Good evening. Madam Mayor and Madam Vice Mayor, congratulations. Um, so I know there's another agenda item, so I'm just going to try and keep it um, short. We are still working on our 2019-2020 work plans. Um, and our park semester plan has been... Um, the room pushed over to staff, so that pretty, feels pretty good to um, have that move through our committee. Um, I believe that our farmer's market work plan is now um, complete and has been satisfied. Um, thank you, Council Member Flores, for your support in that. Um, we're still working on our social media and marketing plan. Um, San Juan Batista 150 is almost complete for the sesquicentennial, so all those events have um, gone through. I am interested in having somewhat of a review, um, maybe with the staff support to see how, because there was kind of unusual budget was um, given for that event in our committee and then managed by one of our subcommittees. So um, because that's use of public funds, we want to make sure that's a transparent process as well. What was kind of like a follow up, maybe. Um, asking that chair to provide some kind of like report back for council so you kind of see what the how that budget was used and um, if there are any resources remaining or um, if there were any purchased items to for further use for the city um, we're also we've received our first public art request and so um, the subcommittee is um, bringing back the public art policy Hopefully that will come through our committee and present it, be presented to you for a recommendation um, in collaboration with the San Benito Arts Council. So that's kind of um, what's going on with our last year's work plans and then we are going to be um, going back to the strategic planning matrix to develop our 2020-2021 work plans. Um, I do have comments to make on discussion item 8B. And then um, we've also presented and discussed um, collaboration with the Youth Commission multiple times. I myself have presented and made requests to appear on their agenda so they could um, discuss and take potential action. Um, there is a portion of the strategic plan of the general plan of the city that the Youth Commission has responsibility for. Um, and also the strategic planning committee, we have our own responsibility. Um, we were discussing with the city manager um, how our committees can support the work of the council without crossing over into the responsibility of the planning commission and responsibility of the city council. We really want to try and like focus our work. We're volunteers. We're appointed to serve um, at the pleasure of the council, but we also have experienced a great scope of work in 2019. Um, and some of it, I think, has kind of brought us out of what um, the purpose of our committee is. So we're really wanting to focus that in um, both strategic planning committee. We want to recommend to the youth commission as well that they be able to have the support of our committee and how to um, identify the responsibilities in the general plan and then be able to either implement or take action um, and I haven't gotten responses back from the chair I've made requests on um, to appear on their agenda and come in person about three times so if there's any support um, that the council can offer um, I think that that could bring about a greater success for both of our the youth commission and then strategic planning committee um, and then also on behalf of the Strategic Planning Committee, um, there is a recommendation to Council to appoint new members to the Strategic Planning Committee to support our recruitment efforts. To support uh, what? Recruitment efforts. We have some people who have stepped down and um, numbers dwindling. So, um, but I think there's other further discussion and a different agenda item. 8B, right. About that. 
But I just, because that was a vote taken, I wanted to make sure that that recommendation got brought as it was voted on. Um, but I believe that that recommendation will be addressed in the discussion item 8B, Strategic Planning Committee Membership and Bylaws Review. And um, that's what I have for you, unless there are questions for me. Councilman DeVries. <laughs> Through the, through the chair, through the mayor. Mandy, so who, and, and to the city manager too, who's in charge of the farmer's market? Um, I do not know. I was not a part, that was my work plan that I brought through. I believe it was satisfied by staff and um, the council itself. I don't know if um, council well, members. Give me an understanding of how, so there's a farmer's market on Sunday mornings, I think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there a promoter there that's in charge of the whole thing? Yes. Yeah, the city? Yes, yeah, so the mayor brought it for it. His name is uh, J, uh, James. It's, uh, I can't the last name. The same promoter that does the uh, Salinas Farmers Market uh, came in with a special event uh, uh, a approval for road closure for the city council about three months ago, it seems like, and it took us a while to get them up and rolling. On a weekly basis, they're coordinating uh, with logistics with public works for barricades and restrooms and things. Mm -hmm. But he uh, promotes and, and brings a lot of the same vendors from the, the Saturday morning market to uh, San Juan Bautista on Sunday mornings. Last name is a guy named James? I don't have his last name in front of me. I can't, I, yeah. I can't remember. I, I can get you that information. I don't have it. I'll catch up with you later. <laughs> That's the only question I have. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. The way so. this transpired was that he, uh, <coughs> the promoter, actually caught me at the at the rib cookout, the the rotary rib cookout, and he says, you know, I've tried to get a hold of your your people. I've called four or five times. Nobody ever answered my calls. Da 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 da. da. So I says, well, give me the info and we'll mm -hmm. see what we can do. Yeah. And we got everybody work, working on, and Todd was helping out, and we got it all, and it's, it's off. And he. The thing is that if there is an event already planned for the day, they don't set up. Yeah, and that's good. So they yeah, yeah. It's, the, go, the, the schedule is, he worked out a whole year schedule mm -hmm. and all that. He wants to do, you know, he wanted to do it uh, uh, on a weekly basis. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I've been to it a couple of times. It's, and it's I've heard nice. real good response yeah. from it. I really haven't been yeah. really involved the, in it. The but, produce yeah. and the plants, it's been, it's been nice. But thank you, Matt Deesa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Council Member Mayor Edge, the gentleman's name is Jerry Lammy. Jerry. Oh, Jerry. West Lammy. Coast Farmers Market. Jerry Lammy. I knew he had a. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, I Thank you. I uh, that did the, uh, the design for the, for the market. The, the poster, I guess, is oh. the one that did it. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, Clay, now we go on to uh, public hearing <coughs> items. <clears throat> so we uh, have um, consider approval of second addendum San Juan Bautista 2015-2019 housing element mitigated negative de declaration in support of adoption of the San Juan Bautista fifth cycle housing element four year update 2019-2023. Thank you Mayor Edge. I'll just introduce Richard from the NC. Um, this is the same uh, uh, report and recommendation presented to the Planning Commission at their December meeting. It was unanimously approved, um, and it's basically a reiteration, uh, getting us into cycle five. We were on cycle, we got caught up last month to uh, cycle four. We're making tremendous progress. Uh, we have uh, approval and acceptance of cycle four from the state housing community developments. They've been very uh, supportive of us and of uh, Richard and, and uh, our, our associate planner Todd's hard work and, and uh, Martin you've met as well. So uh, Richard, do you have a quick presentation for us? Yeah, good evening Mayor Edge and Council members. Uh, back in October, you approved a housing element. Unfortunately, that one's only good till December 31st. <coughs> so we're here for a second one. I'm gonna present on both <coughs> items A and B together for this uh, presentation. Okay. Um, the first part. item is uh, on your agenda is item A, and it's um, sequel addendum adoption, and the second item related to that is the housing element adoption. 
Um, this housing element would be for the 2019 to 2023 period, so you'll be good for four years. Uh, this adoption, unlike the one in October, will be timely, so it will be, you, the city will be in full compliance with housing element law uh, if the council adopts the housing element tonight. So the housing element mitigated negative declaration was adopted also on October 8th, uh, 2019. There was an addendum prepared uh, to address a new um, affordable housing site. Uh, a second addendum has been prepared for this evening's action. That's an addendum, the second addendum to the housing element mitigated negative declaration and it addresses the handful of changes to the housing element on this uh, second round. Leaning on to the housing element itself, the process for this draft of the housing element, uh, it was submitted to the state's Housing and Community Development Department on September 30th for a 60-day review. We, we requested expedited review because of the time frames here. Um, HCD got their comments back to the city on October 21st, so three weeks. They had, us, had their comments turned back around to the city. Uh, much appreciate the efforts they've made on our behalf. Um, the revisions from the city were sent back to HCD on October 28th, and at that point it was simply a waiting game for resolutions and official paperwork to pass through on the October 8th adoption before they could write their uh, official letter. That letter came through on November 25th, finding that the draft housing element, which is the one you have in front of you, uh, meets the statutory requirements of state housing law. So if the city council adopts the housing element this evening, we have pretty much assurance from the state that they will certify it when it gets to them. So the housing element changes. There were several updates that are pretty basic. Um, we added the uh, information on the public workshop that was held on August 13th, updated the vacant sites, particularly that um, site D that got added in in the last actions. That's a Rodriguez property on Mukalemi, 70 Mukalemi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 70 Mukalemi, the Rodriguez property, with the Chalmers house. Yeah, the Chalmers mm -hmm. House property. Uh -huh. And then uh, the programs that were accomplished since October 8th's adoption of the housing element, we rushed those through to you um, a couple meetings ago, I believe. Uh, those were essential to get that housing okay. element in compliance and stage for this next one that we are considering this evening. Uh, there are four new programs in the 2019-2023 housing element. Uh, one is supportive housing by right. One is low barrier navigation centers. Uh, there's SB permit streamlining what and... Does that, what does that mean? I'm going to go into detail on each of these four. Oh. So I'll get right to it. Okay. Um, and advertise reasonable accommodations. Uh, so the first one, I'm going to take these in the order that I just mentioned them. Supportive housing by right, that is in the housing element as program 3.7. It is required by Assembly Bill 2162, which was adopted by the legislature in 2018, signed by the governor. Uh, supportive housing <coughs> is for individuals who... Excuse me, yeah. I'm sorry. Do we have a page that we can refer to <coughs> that you can give, tell us? Yes. We're all flipping pages. I have it tabbed here. Let's see. So programs 3.7 and 3.8 are on page 5-9. Okay, thank you. My copy, they are in red line. Um, they may be in yours as well. I tried to avoid the slideshow. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> it was not, making things, not making things no, any we're, faster. We're all flipping pages. <laughs> and I, and I sorry. Okay. Has everybody found page 5-9? Page 209. 5-9. All right, so program 3.7 is required. It's a state mandate. Uh, as I said, supportive housing is for individuals who aren't able to live independently. And so it's kind of like assisted living for seniors, except it's any adult who, for whatever reason, can't live independently. So it's that type of housing and it has to be allowed under state law now in any district that allows multifamily housing or mixed use. So that's true statewide. Every jurisdiction is going to be required to adjust their zoning 
to add that basically as a line in their list of approved uses uh, for those types of districts. And that has to be done within one year of the zoning code amendment. And then going to the next program, which is low barrier navigation centers. Uh, that is program 3.8 on the same page. Uh, that's required by government code section 65660. Uh, navigation center has to be an allowed use in districts that allow multifamily housing and mixed use. Uh, so same, same situation. Um, a low barrier navigation center is basically, uh, they've been in the news a lot up in San Francisco. They're basically a center that provides a variety of services to homeless people. And so the, the zoning code change is simply accommodating that use in these particular districts. There's Certainly no glad you told us that because I had an idea somehow it was like a low ramp for people in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> That's no, what no. I was thinking. No, the Planning Commission <laughs> had the same question. Um, it's, it's referred to as wraparound services. Um, yeah. Each individual has a certain set of needs. It's that, it's that really hard transition between living on the street and living in an apartment yeah. and making that transition. So the same thing, this is a zoning code change from a city standpoint so that there will be districts within the city that accommodate that use. It's not actually you know, providing that use at all. And again, that needs to be um, accomplished within one year of adoption of the housing element. And then the next one comes out of uh, Senate Bill 35, uh, permit streamlining for low income housing if a jurisdiction is not meeting its RENA numbers, its regional Slide housing numbers. needs, regional housing needs um, numbers, Rena. the ones that are um, handed down by the council, council of governments. Um, if the city is not meeting that goal of providing those housing units actually on the ground, then there are a couple of things that get triggered and HCD has determined that San Juan Batista is subject to this. Um, action that is the ministerial approval of low-income housing units and waiver of CEQA so it's exempt from CEQA what? so if someone so comes what are, through what are our numbers oh. and, and how has the state determined that we are sufficient or insufficient uh, we had this conversation there's 41 total required okay. in the yeah, uh, <laughs> you and I did but this was several months so several months ago it's sorry on page uh, <laughs> Uh, low, low and mod income are 16 units. Uh, those are the, the critical ones, uh, the hardest ones to meet. Remember, just the 16 units. And then, and then 10 units are required at the uh, median moderate income level. And then the rest are actually market rate, which we are satisfying. Yeah. So therefore, net what? 41 total. Net what do we need? 41. This is, I think this is what you and I talked about, Don. So therefore, right. therefore so, so the, well, the total is 41. 41. Right. 41. Right. Right. Yeah. So but we have four years to accomplish that. Yeah, to get to the other part of the question, we're halfway through the planning period to which that target applies. So at the halfway point, we would obviously expect roughly half the unit should be permitted at this point. Uh, obviously, that's something that's somewhat out of the control of the council because you don't apply and get permits for housing yourselves. So the hope is, of course, some builder comes in and sees the opportunity here in San Juan Batista and builds those houses. Um, but if they don't, then the process to get those built gets streamlined. So in a project that might otherwise require a conditional use permit or some other site plan review, that type of a permitting had to go through planning commission and or up to city council would be ministerial and handled by staff. And there would be no CEQA requirement. Mm -hmm. wow. It's the state kind of pressing its finger down harder. That's a, that's a hard press. Yeah. And again, that must be, um, those code changes have to be in the zoning code within one year of adoption of the housing element. Uh, the next, that was on so page So we don't have those in, those in our code right now? Is no, that, there's no, no, nothing in the city's code that has that process in it. So I'm presuming that we have a year from January 1, so all of 2020 to, to pass that? Is yeah, that, you've yeah. got basically all next year to pass that. Right. And I, there's three or four of these that can all get bundled together and okay. prepared and adopted together. And then the last program is um, on the next page, 513. 
No, it doesn't look right. No, it isn't. It's on 512. My flag's on 513. So the bottom of page 512, and that is advertising reasonable accommodations. Uh, one of the actions that the council took last time when it adopted that series of ordinances was a reasonable accommodations um, ordinance uh, that the city would provide whatever reasonable accommodation was necessary for a person with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And That's so this program is simply program. a program forwarding that and putting it actually into effect. And that, that does not require any kind of a further ordinance. Uh, it's something staff will deal with you know, as the need arises. So those are the four programs that got added. Uh, three of them are mandate. Actually, most of them, I think, are mandates. Um, they all are. Um, so the next steps, assuming that the council adopts the housing element this evening, the next steps would be for the housing element and adopting resolutions to be submitted by staff to the state. Uh, they will then certify the housing element and send the city a letter confirming that the city is now in compliance with state housing law. Uh, there is an ordinance on accessory dwelling units that was in progress with the last housing element and because of additional changes in state law, staff decided to hold that for the moment. Uh, that may come back in the next year. Uh, and then there are the three mandatory zoning code amendments that we just discussed that are due by December of next year. And then the next housing element is all four years away where you need to adopt another one. That would be, if, assuming that gets adopted on time, that would be the second timely adoption and you'd be back on the eight year mm -hmm. cycle. And that concludes my presentation. Good. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Questions, anybody? Okay, so um, this is a public hearing, Mayor. So you want to open the public so, hearing? Yeah. Please. Do we have any uh, public comments? I don't have any. Comments. Okay. All right, we move on then. <coughs> um, under <coughs> excuse me, under action items. We have six C first. Oh, I jumped ahead. Well, um, these, these both resolutions need to be voted on. Oh, that's right. right. We need to vote on the re resolutions. Right. So you have. Okay. Um, so do I have? Six A and then six B. Uh, do we? Do I have a, a motion to to vote on these two resolutions? I make a motion that six A be approved according to the staff report and the recommendations of the council. Thank I'll you. I'll second it. Thank you. So, Cal Councilman DeBreeze so first. Uh, yeah, and there's, uh, there's A and B. Right? <coughs> and uh, Freeman, Councilman Freeman, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now we go on to C. C. Yes, there's two. B. B. Oh, that's right. And I'll move that we uh, pass the uh, <coughs> fifth cycle so, so there's housing the element for 2019 through. 2023. Thank you. I'll second it. Okay. So those all in favor? Uh, aye. Signify aye. Saying aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Now we Thank go you. on to see. That's a great big step. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, uh, Martin and Todd. Yeah, it was a great uh, report. And Richard. Yeah. And Richard. <laughs> I'll pass that along for Thank you. Good job. Kudos to you guys. That was a great report. Thank you. Thanks. So, so um, now, yes, I'm sorry. No, Maybe no, on. that's right. Um, no. We, we're going to introduce an ordinance to rescind cannabis dispensary ban ordinance. Right. Right, um, members of the city council, uh, this is just a, uh, a matter of uh, cleanup. Um, when the voters approved the, the, uh, the cannabis uh, ordinance in 2018, November 2018, limiting cannabis uh, processes to our industrial zoning code, it left in place a 2011 and 2013, 2017 law that prohibited cannabis altogether. The original law in 2011 was passed in a special meeting in response to the legalization of medical marijuana. And then in 2017, when the uh, state passed a, a broader uh, 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 legislation, 
We again banned the, uh, the prohibited the sale of uh, cannabis and, and, and cannabis activities. So what this does is it identifies the two pieces of the ordinance that were now obsolete as a result of the approval of the ballot measure. So we have a conflict in our, in our code right now where we have two measures prohibiting cannabis activities and then we have a ballot measure that's gone into effect subsequently approving uh, with certain limitations and restrictions. And so uh, staff has drafted an ordinance to rescind the uh, 2011 and 2017 uh, ordinances so that we could move forward with the implementation of the ballot measure. And uh, with that, if the council has any questions, I'm happy to respond and the city attorney can help as well. Through the mayor, may I supplement that a little bit? Sure. So, and, and uh, ask the city attorney to jump in here at any time. So, all of a sudden, California approves marijuana, and Samuel Batista was caught flat footed. Oh my gosh, what, what do we do? Because we didn't have any ordinances or rules or anything right. in place. So, our city attorney, Ms. Deborah Mall, recommended that we just put a stop to everything until we figure it out. So, we put a complete ban on everything while we figured it out. And we did figure it out. I think we came up with a good statutory scheme and a good regulatory scheme. And now that that's all in place, it's time to lift off the total ban that you recommended we put in place. Is that right, Deb? Can you comment on that? Yes, that's true. And it, it was always planned that it would stay in place until the very last piece of the puzzle came in, which happened when you passed the um, resolution to do the rules and regs. So that was last meeting. So it isn't just that there's a conflict. It was actually planned to stay in place. And so this will be, um, uh, it'll require a second reading and then 30 days after that. So in 90 days from now, this will be the Wild West again. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We have, we have a good ordinance in place, as Councilmember DeVries said, so that, that it should regulate things pretty well. But the, the point you just made that I want to reiterate is that this isn't willy-nilly. This was all orchestrated to occur this way. Yes. We put a complete ban on everything while we got our house in order. Mm -hmm. The house is now in order, so now it's time to lift the ban. Would you agree? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. Oh, oh public, public, public comment. Public oh, comment. Okay. Do we have public comment? comment? I'm just happy that I get to witness this moment because it's been a long time coming, and I wholeheartedly disagree with the fact that we need to ban a plant that has proven medicinal value. And um, I um, look forward to congratulating each of you for overturning the history of prohibition that, in my opinion, has wholeheartedly been incorrect and based on falsehood. So thank you for making history for our town. I appreciate you. Thank you. OK. So now. No, you want a motion? Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we introduce an ordinance to rescind the cannabis dispensary ban. Ordinance. Mm -hmm. so, Do we have a second? Helpful. I'll second that. Okay. Wholeheartedly. So I'll respond by saying aye. 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 <coughs> aye. No discussion. And, oh, no discussion. Did you guys want to talk about it? No. No. Let's go on. Now we go on to action items. Uh, consider resolution 2019 XX accepting the fiscal year 2019 audit. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just real quick, and just to reiterate, we received the audit report from our consultant. Um, and there were no questions or concerns presented during that measure, so I just leave this for the council's pleasure uh, that uh, follow staff's recommendation and adopt a resolution adopting the audit findings. Okay. All right. So. So moved. So public comment. Do we have a public comment on this? I guess not. So. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now we go on to discussion items. Yeah, so what, what do we do here? So, City guidelines for marijuana growers. Victor uh, Gomez was. Uh, 
Right. And so um, I told Victor that I would cover. He uh, has a commitment in San Jose, and he wasn't sure if he'd be able to make it. I was able to converse with him and share this policy that I uh, presented to the council on the dais. I left a copy for the city clerk. Um, I was reading an article on Fresno and their approach, and I've reviewed um, probably five or six different uh, ordinances in different cities. Um, I was looking at the most conservative ordinances I could to see if I could find a concrete slab or something like that was the nature of the council's concern at the last meeting. Um, even uh, San Mateo and San Luis Obispo that have some of the most restrictive and Fresno, there was no strict requirement for a concrete slab uh, where cultivation occurs as part of one of the cannabis processes. So I asked Victor today, I said, where did that come from? It was in the original Hollister ordinance that was presented back in 2016. And so, so that was gathered up, he said, as a result of looking at even older ordinances from um, the state of Oregon, various cities up there. So uh, he agreed with me, and, and if he were here, he could share that, um, that, that, that that was perhaps uh, more restrictive than it needed to be. Um, that we have certain provisions within our building code and within our city engineers review of uh, stormwater uh, uh, capture and best management practices that are all required by the state water board and other regulatory agencies. And so when I found uh, this language from Fresno, uh, especially um, the item with the green dot by it, uh, refers to uh, providing a cultivation and operations plan and that our city engineer and, and building official have a chance to look at that operations plan uh, to make sure that it exceeds the minimum legal standards for water usage, conservation and use, drainage, runoff, erosion control, the same types of things that I heard the council talk about at our last meeting as far as uh, providing a pea gravel, but maybe with some kind of membrane. And that's the kind of thing that would come from this. But as uh, conditions change and technologies change, the specifics for this may change as well. So. Um, recall that each cannabis use has to come forward as a conditional use permit, so each project would be evaluated on its own. And what language like this does is say, we want a, a plan that shows us exactly how you're going to address these health and safety concerns that we may have regarding your property. So rather than dictating the use, we're allowing the cultivator to come to us with a plan, we have the right to deny it. Um, we have the right to change it or modify it and, and using an engineer and a hydrologist and other professionals who have these standards from the water board and other uh, regulatory agencies to follow. So I think if Victor were here, uh, he would support this more general language because it gives us the discretion on a case-by-case -case basis to regulate exactly uh, how that would come, come to be. But it does remove the, the one and only way of creating a concrete slab. That's the way, the, I think, a relatively restrictive way that our ordinance is written now. And it does broaden it up to allow the cultivator to come up with a plan. So that was the proposal. We hadn't written that into a revised ordinance yet. But if the council has comments or suggestions on an idea such as this, we'd take that forward. Um, I did ask the city engineer to come up with specifications, as you suggested, council member, on what the pea gravel and the membrane and, and those layers would look like. Um, I, she hasn't gotten back to me yet. She was on jury duty today, but that's no excuse. Um, so I, I, was, <laughs> I, I was looking into that, but that's really into the finite detail of, of the building official and building code. So um, Victor thought that we should just back off and, and, and let the professionals use their discretion, but, but we get the last vote. The council gets the last vote on these matters as well, yeah. part of the conditional yeah. use permit. And I carry the last vote, but I, I still want the concrete floor. And, and I have a question on that. <clears throat> um, somewhere I read, and I apologize, I don't know the, the page number, it said re removal of concrete. Was that the mm -hmm. removal of the word concrete, concrete or mm -hmm. actually removing concrete from a site to have um, I, uh, was that in the minutes? I think no, I read, I oh, read it. Oh, that's too. where it was. It was in the minutes. It was in the minutes. It was removed of the language oh, okay. referring to concrete. All right. Okay. Because I remember yes. reading Not the <laughs> actual <laughs> removal not, of not dump concrete trucks that's and, already and there. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> More like a, a delete, delete. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. I have a comment. Go ahead. Um, uh, city manager. Reynolds, as, as you alluded to, and as I said last time this topic came up, I will not vote, vote in favor of removing the concrete slab requirement unless there are agreed upon mandated cross sections. Okay. As to what 
Fair enough. be placed by the concrete slab. And I want to see 12 inches of base rock with a membrane and, and specifications as to the membrane and so forth to protect our earth from runoff and all these other things. I don't, I'm not comfortable with just saying like, oh, just submit something and the city will approve it or not. Because that seems too willy-nilly to me. It seems that if someone doesn't happen to be here at the time when that's turned in, someone can say, yeah, that's fine. And it's not fine. That's true. And why are you shaking your head? Is the public comment open? Not yet, but we should have, I know you hate concrete slabs. I know you do. But we can still, we can still have. cultural crop that has a seed that goes in the ground. So we should, we should call for it. Yeah, we should, we should, we should call for it. I'm out. I just, I just want to see, I want to see a proposed cross section. Okay, we're working on that as well. The, the bottom line is we weren't ready for a solid policy yet, so we thought we'd bounce this idea off while we had a chance. Yeah, this, this, this bounce off seems too willy nilly to me. It seems too open to interpretation. Okay. Fair, fair enough, Councilmember. Okay. So I think we should maybe direct the engineer to to make sure there's a specific type of plan required, and that would be a stormwater pollution runoff plan. And, and it is required. Plan. It is yeah, required of every project. Commonly called a SWIP. Well, that's and, from uh, they can address most of those things within that SWIP, uh, and then. You know, your standard business plan should take care of the rest. Uh, uh, if it's built to zoning and code, code specs, if Dan wants tw 12 inches of a certain kind of rock, I think that's a little restrictive. I think best practices change over time. And no, Dan, Dan doesn't want 12 inches of rock. Dan just wants someone more <laughs> with more expertise than I do to yeah. say, Here's what an yeah. effective cross section Well, I, I, I know. What I'm saying is we draw should, that, should be flexible. As you see with, with everything else, and yes. put it in the code. I still so have you're not going to do a slab. This is a cross section that would be acceptable to the city of San Juan Batista. Okay. okay, I agree. I just think we should be flexible because best practices change over time. That's, uh, that's sure all they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And but the code, but the this, code is, yeah. this is still very new to everybody all over. So I don't know. I just, I just still feel that, you know, um, I tend to agree with, with Dan if we have to have um, something other than the, the slab. I think it would be uh, more acceptable to have the slab, the concrete slab. But that's my feeling. I just want to be able to protect our, our environment. So. Um, should we go on? Oh, did you uh, want to have public test comment on this? Do we have public comment on this? I do. You do? Okay. Mandy Sisnodi. Thank you. Um, I'm more talking to the council members who've been here and been educated for years now on this issue. My criticism is you're continuing to make policy from a place of ignorance because you haven't done your research. Okay? If you want to require a concrete slab, make indoor only licenses. That's what Don't is. have even the opportunity for someone to get in their idea that they can bring actual farming practices to this town because you're requiring them to effectively build a building and produce an agricultural crop indoors. If it's on a slab, it's in a building. If it has a fixed walls, they have to use artificial lights. If you're requiring the roof to be immovable, you will never produce a, an actual outdoor from seed in the soil under the sun crop. You will effectively remove this small budding industry's ability to produce organic standard. What you're doing is requiring artificial standards at every step of the way. You're writing policy that is going to affect generations in the future that you're not going to live to see. So what I really would like to see for maybe the newer members on the council are to do your research, to study the policy, to understand the policies that have written that have been, been um, shown to be flawed and have very much more sophisticated municipalities than our own have made errors doing things like this because they're making the law based on a prohibit, uh, your, your, your mindset is based on prohibition. Right? 
and um, so you want to restrict it as if this is an illegal drug, which it isn't. This is agricultural crop, right? And we know agriculture very well. How many greenhouses do we see that have a concrete slab? It makes sense, right? Is there ever, are there tomatoes grown in this way? Are there flowers grown in this way? Like you're making up new agricultural science to take an accommodation because your personal bias goes back to a point where this used to be illegal, right? And I understand why it is that way. I understand that it's not your fault because you didn't create the war on drugs and you didn't create reefer madness and you didn't ban this, right? But now you have a responsibility to the public to create sound policy. Sound policy is protecting our land, like the mayor, Madam Mayor said. That land over there, the four parcels that you've zoned for cannabis, is all, it's open space, it's ag land. It's not industrial land. There are no um, slabs poured out there. So you're going to irrevocably change the, the Dale Coke has an organic farm there. I'm out of time. I have eight, 17 seconds. But um, I would say, please use reason. Please use, do your research. And don't just make policy based on a whim that comes from um, propaganda, right? This is an actual like, scientific proven farming practice that's part of our culture as a town. So your policies should reflect that, the people of your town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank so. you. Okay, this side to go. All right. We, so have, we have more. We have more? Mm-hmm. Is it Cynthia Orco or Orozco? Orozco. Hi, I'm Cynthia Orozco, and I'm the owner of 18 acres of the industrial zone land. Um, that you guys changed zoning onto for, I'm assuming, cannabis purpose. Um, we've been here for two, almost two years, trying to get plants to build a warehouse. And cannabis has been the top thing that almost every city manager or person that I've talked to right here in this place has brought to my attention. I was against it in the beginning because I really didn't know too much information about it and I always looked at it as a drug. But now I see the medical purpose about it and how it helps others. And um, what I see is that it's just been becoming more and more difficult, more of a problem with you guys trying to put concrete, trying to do this, trying to do that. It's like, it is just a plant. It's a plant. They've already told you guys and explained to you guys in regards to how much chemicals used to just plant regular lettuce and cucumbers and stuff like that. So I'm not really sure if you guys want the land to be kept land, putting cement over it. How are you guys expecting to remove that? That's very costly. Me knowing the cost I'm trying to build a warehouse, how costly it is to put just 5,000 square feet. You guys imagine how much it's gonna cost to try to bring cannabis and put it on top of cement. Nobody's gonna wanna do it. That's lost to the city revenue. So if that's what you guys wanna do, you guys, you guys are free to do that. But you guys are, whatever you guys decided, you guys zone and why you guys change the zoning to these properties to become industrial, because it's quite fishy how you guys did it. Quite fishy. I didn't even know when I first bought the property that that was zoned for. But you guys are making it very difficult. So the person that I, that the investors that have been looking into my property, they've already told me, you guys want concrete, you guys want all these extra things. They're not coming. They're not coming onto board. There's better places where they can waste less money and they can profit more. And those cities are going to take the revenue that you guys are trying to waste. So you guys make your choice. I, I think, you know, you guys have every right of thinking of, you know, of being safe and, and thinking about how you guys want to take care of our property, our land. It's perfectly fine. But cement, it's what are you going to do with cement? I mean, how is it going to help you guys? What are you going to do when we remove the cement? When cannabis goes to down the water, what are you going to do with all that cement? How are we going to break it? What's going to be the use of the property then? It's costly to put it on. It's going to be costly to take it off. Nobody's going to want to do it. That's the point. Members keep saying. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Any more comments? I think I think a point of clarification might be in order at this juncture. The requirement for a, a cement slab is in the ordinance now already. What we're talking about is eliminating that requirement. So we would agree with you, or I would. I don't think the mayor agrees with you, but I would agree in eliminating that requirement as 
long as something else can be put in its place that provides the same protection, like base rock in a membrane or something of that sort. But this isn't a question of whether we should have s cement or not. Well, I guess maybe it might be for you. Exactly. But we're, we're considering an alternative to some yeah. slabs. That's what's on the, the table. The change was just the base rock is just a little more expensive. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's well, let's, let's go. Thank you. Okay. Let's go. We're going to go on. And the next item uh, is strategic planning uh, membership and bylaws review. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, and after attending the strategic planning committee meeting um, and and uh, being asked by them to send something to the council to address membership um, and having been to three uh, strategic planning committee meetings in a row, uh, each time uh, asking the question, do we have a quorum, um, and asking other various questions about the membership, I took the time about 10 days ago to review the bylaws in detail and um, spoke with uh, the chair of the Strategic Planning Committee and uh, a few council members about the, the composition. Also with uh, Shauna Friels, who felt strongly about the need to uh, uh, express at the Strategic Planning Committee uh, the need to bolster membership. So I went back and found uh, when the original uh, members were appointed, there were originally 23 members appointed to the Strategic Planning Committee. Um, there, the bylaws described that their duties uh, would would entail until completed, so there was no specific term for the committee members. Um, we had, I guess, 23 great people back then to choose from because back in, in March of this year, we were able to find 10 and we reappointed 10 members to the committee. I wasn't aware of that until this, this morning. Um, so, but with that, um, uh, I got uh, people to agree um, that, that perhaps we need an ad hoc committee. In fact, it was the chair's recommendation that we look at a, appointing an ad hoc committee to review the bylaws and to add some meat to them because uh, they, they lack um, a definition, how many members, what is their term, um, um, when do they term out. And, and so before we appoint new members, we thought it only fair that we amend what a membership means and then move forward. And so. Uh, if the council agree, is agreeable, we would appoint an ad hoc committee, a temporary committee to review the bylaws that would consist of two council members, two uh, strategic planning committee members, and myself to come back uh, with a new set of bylaws to the strategic planning committee that would help us uh, define these things moving forward. So with that, um, the staff report does outline a, a, a tremendous amount of work that they've done and accomplishments, uh, but that gets to the heart of the matter. Uh, we're, we're looking for the council's direction uh, by consensus of uh, whether we should move forward and, and form an ad hoc committee. So I, I'd, just like to, I'd just like to add some detail to that, particularly uh, as to the uh, 23 members of the original strategic planning committee meeting. Uh, the original idea was to gather all the stakeholders in the, in the community, and that would include people from the mission, people from the state park, people from downtown uh, historic shopping district, or, or what we call Third Street, and other members of the community that um, had an interest in, in, in doing this. Um, I, I don't mean to be too critical here, but it might have been a little bit too ambitious. Uh, the, the, some, of, some of those stakeholders I just described bailed rather quickly, the state being the very first, you know, after the, and, 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 and the rest, frankly, bailed too, so it just left people who were kind of interested in, 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 in city government and in, in improving, imp improving the environment of San Juan Batista. So, so, so that's why there were so many members at one time, and they weren't really all elected, they were kind of, the mission gave I think it was two people, the Father Ed and somebody else, and the State Park sent the head guy and somebody else, and, and you know, and, and, and you do that a couple of times and it adds up, but, but those people kind of slipped away, slid away after a while. Well, you know, I think it's a good idea to have an ad hoc committee. Yeah, Just put one together and, and get two council people and maybe 
if we can try and get somebody from the mission. They're, they're all new people over there now anyway. Right. And there's a lot of new people at the state park, so. So we define who the membership is, specifically who those inclusive stakeholders are, and put that into the bylaws and try and fill the seats on that yeah. basis. Right. Well, I'm going to warn you, if you make it too specific, you'll, you'll make it, it really, really yeah, hard to get the That makes community it even harder. Right. It, it works. Some things work better if their guidelines are a little looser. Okay, so I'll, I'll look to the mayor and 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 uh, uh, Mayor Edge. You can talk to your council members and see who you'd like to put together, and I'll work with the chair, Mandisa, and and we can move forward. Uh, you might, Mandisa, probably has something to say on this item. Oh, we all, oh. I guess you can go ahead and go, yeah. It's just yeah. a discussion. Um, my, my only comments were to support this action. I'm um, willing to volunteer my time to participate in the ad hoc committee. Um, we need guidance and we need a, a very clear scope of what is our responsibility to do and what not to do. Um, the kind of ambiguity and looseness of our bylaws, I believe up until this point have worked for us. And then um, having so much action and so many things happen in 2018 <coughs> and 2019, and then um, definitely with the sesquicentennial, introducing a budget into our committee with no guidance at all of how to manage city funds <coughs> at all. Just like $10,000, here you go. For, I mean, Having ethical people on the board, I feel like we did pretty well, but um, that probably gives us an idea of things that we need to work on to tighten up. Um, and city manager and I have kind of um, created some synergy working well together, so um, I'm happy and willing, if so, um, it, it, you know, if recommended or appointed by the council to participate, invited by the ad hoc to participate or, um, I'm willing and happy to be in service in that way uh, and to continue on as chair into the next year to kind of support a transition. Um, but again, I serve at your pleasure, so I just wanted to voice my support for Don. I think it's definitely been a lot for um, our associate planner to serve as secretary and to not have a specific um, secretary, even having our um, what are they called? Like chair, vice chair, like our roles? Def are, we don't officers. have defined officers, right. We don't have our defined officers like youth commission does, or like the planning commission does. Um, and then we're also appointed by the council, but we don't have terms, these type of things. Um, and, and the biggest thing is that even our work was undefined before um, Ed Twos had presented to us the idea of work plans in 2018. You know, and that was the first time that we took the strategic planning implements or the, uh, the implementation matrix and translated it into our actual work to implement, advise, and to recommend to council. Um, and so it's just an opportunity, uh, opportunity to clarify for our volunteers so we don't exhaust our volunteers. We've lost a lot of members, I think, because there's been a lot of work um, and not a lot of guidance and not a lot of structure. So it's just, I think, an opportunity for us to refine ourselves, to get a little bit more sophisticated. The Youth Commission was born out of the Strategic Planning Committee, so I think that like the work that our volunteers are doing for the city is definitely valuable and important work. And then the council just, um, you know, your service is needed to help guide us and give us some standards. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. And everything you said, I feel that is uh, starting to fall into place, and I'm sure that the committee will, will come up with some answers for everybody. Thank you. Okay. Are there other speakers? Is that it? Is that that's, it. That's, it. that's it. So that's it. So now we go on uh, to no fault evictions. <laughs> so um, council members, I've uh, passed to the council uh, an example of a policy from the city of Salinas and uh, most recently today uh, a rather in-depth article um, 
uh, city steps up to halt multiple evictions. Uh, all in response to uh, one of the multitude of housing bills approved by the governor and go into effect January 1. This one puts a cap on rent increases. And what has happened uh, around the state, and, and the city attorney can help me here, is that some landlords have responded in a reactionary mode saying, wow, January 1, I can only increase the rent up to 5%. So a number of cities have taken action um, sooner in December than this, if not in November, to try and prevent landlords from fault, a no-fault eviction saying, I'm going to triple the rent, so you need to get out. Um, and it's caused some hardships. And, and this article in particular, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but talks about some real hardships and some real cases in the city of Salinas and uh, I think the city of uh, Marina. Um, but it goes into quite a bit of detail about how uh, increasing rents and spiking rents can, can contribute to homelessness. So the best intentions of the state have caused a bit of a local emergency here, especially in the month of December, waiting for that state law to go into effect January 1. Um, the, the city attorney can speak to how effective we can be at this point. It's pretty, pretty late in the, in the game to, to make changes. Yeah, but right. yeah, you just have two, you have two weeks, right? And so um, if you were to do this, you could do it at a special meeting, and you need a four-fifths vote, but you also need for an urgency ordinance, which means it comes into place right at that moment rather than two readings and 30 days. Um, you need to have a um, clear and present public health problem. So in other cities, that has been somebody coming to City Hall or coming to a council member and complaining that they were kicked out of their their housing um, with, with um, um, no fault. So um, the, the ordinances that are being put in place say that the landlords cannot issue a no-fault eviction between the passage of the ordinance and the first of the year. So you can see that probably the evil deeds have already been done if there has been any in the city. Because as I know, there hasn't been anybody that's complained like the other cities that have had this. Um, but if there is somebody out there, um, and we did pass an ordinance, um, there are some people that think that there could be a retroactivity to the ordinance. Um, I don't know if this is the case because lawyers we have on board, it's awful hard to say to a landlord, well, um, you did evict this person in, in September, but um, now we're saying you can't do it, um, so bring that person back. So it's kind of hard to go yeah. back on these because you don't really constitutionally give the person enough notice that this is going to be the law. Um, so um, I don't know that it would be very effective right now to um, try to, you know, right before the holiday season, try to pass an ordinance. So I think you might have missed the boat. But the good news is without somebody really saying that they've been impacted here, that there might not be impacted yeah, people here yeah. in the city. Yeah. Well, hopefully nobody has been impacted. So bottom line, I missed the boat. Yeah. I think so. I mean, if you did it, if, 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 if you did it, it would just be for a few days. Yeah. Um, it's not worth the trouble. Right? If we hadn't missed the vote, I would have voted in favor of something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because yep. I think it's just painfully unfair for those bastards to do something like this, knowing that this is coming around to kick people out and raise the rent. It's just. They did that in. That's, that's, dirty, dirty, that's dirty pool. Yeah. They, 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 they won the whole apartment building and kicked everybody and said they were going to remodel. Remodel. Yeah. And they, they've had situations like that, I believe, in both Oakland and San Francisco, and it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of the housing crisis that is kind of hitting the whole state, as, as you know. Yeah. You well, a lot of it is greed, <laughs> you, you to say it. You tell those landlords if they do something like this in this town and they come into City Hall to change as much as a light bulb, <laughs> we're going to be on them. <laughs> we'll be keeping track. <laughs> Building permits, you name it. Right, Don? Right. Okay, so let's go on to item D. C, D, B. D, we're done. We're almost done. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Um, Grant process. <coughs> <coughs> yes, yes. Um, so now that we've passed our housing element, everything's fine, right? Let's go. Um, we have close to a million dollars in grants already out there in the last two months. Um, this is the Community Development Block Grant um, is in our budget, so I wanted to share it with the City Council for those who aren't familiar with it, because uh, should the city uh, attempt to go down this road and apply for these grants, it also brings on a pretty uh, 
a substantial administrative burden and reporting requirements and so forth. Um, I've used it a lot in my career. I wrote my master's thesis on the grant. It's been around since, uh, since uh, President Nixon uh, left office. In fact, President Ford signed the bill. <laughs> so it's a result of all the, uh, it's a result of categorical <laughs> grants that President Johnson created to fight the war on poverty, and all those grants started competing against each other. So that's what block means. They, they put this chunk of money into a block, and they said, local government, find a use for this money for your low and moderate income uh, citizens. And so then cities get to have some discretion. And, and so for that, I provided a, a pretty good summary from the Department of Housing and Community Development of the various programs that could be used. Uh, to serve the low and moderate income people in a community. Um, interestingly enough, in 2014, a previous city manager applied to HCD for a, uh, a million dollar grant of this nature uh, to uh, install our pellet plant. And we can notice out in San Juan Hollister Road that the pellet plant is still on its side. So we were unsuccessful with that attempt, but infrastructure is something that you can do with this grant as well as housing programs. I think. Um, the interim city manager, when he put the budget together, was looking at a technical assistance grant, about $100,000, to help implement exactly what EMC was sharing with us. Here's a hundred grand to help uh, facilitate uh, the accessory dwelling unit policies and then the zone changes required to promote affordable housing in our community. So we can do that uh, as well. Um, but there has been also a lot of conversation about about um, uh, youth services, after school programs, and so forth. And I meet monthly with the uh, superintendent, and she has mentioned to me more than once the possibility of, of bringing back a newer, better uh, uh, unit uh, on the school district property. They're working on a master plan for that property, uh, maybe doing after school programs here in our community hall. And, and there is a 15% uh, portion of these funds that can be used for social services to pay for the operations. But if you're going to build a facility, of a $5 million or $20 million facility, you need to demonstrate that you can operate that. And that was a situation that I got into when I bought a church in Salinas and the Boys and Girls Club signed a lease. And sure enough, after 2008, they couldn't afford the million dollars a year to operate that facility and it never got built. So um, the sustainability of the operations is something that, that HUD will uh, evaluate when they look at the grant application. But I just wanted to share with the council, um, fortunately, they extended the deadline from mid-February uh, to mid-March. And we can talk about this again, or even uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to do like a town hall meeting and a strategic planning meeting in February um, would give us a chance to consider possible uses for this grant funds. So um, before it got any later uh, in the calendar year, heading into next spring because we have deadlines, I wanted to introduce this to the council and see if you had any ideas or, or thoughts about the material we've provided for you as background. It's, uh, we don't do a single audit right now. We don't pay for that. If you get federal funds up to a certain threshold, then you're subject to this whole single audit act. And, and instead of state prevailing wages, you also now would have Davis-Bacon and federal prevailing wages. You would have procurement policies that are unique to the federal government. Uh, you would have NEPA as well as CEQA. So you'd have federal environmental clearance as well as, as, well as California Environmental Quality Act. Um, and so it just adds another layer. So although it's you know, it's nice to think of grants as free money, uh, but uh, this is definitely money that you have to work to maintain and to sustain. So I just wanted to share that with you uh, because uh, a lot of people hear about it and talk about it, and I just wanted you to provide this information tonight so you knew. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So do we get to discuss it a little bit here? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Not too long. Not too Say long. 20 almost. <laughs> okay. So, um, as we were talking, we, we already have a building that's really underused, and that would be the community center during the week. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's only, it's only used one day a week during the week. For the weekends, it's the parties yeah. and stuff. And, and part of the reason why it's underused is because the acoustics are so horrible in there. Uh, but I was thinking we could take some of the block grant money and solve the acoustics problem. They are solvable. And then we could take some of that money and, and, and run a, a youth center there, maybe, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, something like that. Um, one of the things my, 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 my wife made me promise is that if we did get a cannabis tax passed and going, that we would take a certain percentage, and she said 25%, so I'll use that. This will kill me otherwise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
to, to, to donate to, to, to uh, let's just say, youth programs. Mm -hmm. You know, she just thinks that money needs to go to the youth because we don't really do enough for our youth. And so we could use that money, if we ever get to it, to help run the program. That would be my idea. Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, the only thing I would say is that if what you're doing uh, tonight, Don, is just mm -hmm. floating that out there to see if there's interest, absolutely. If you're saying, should this be something we discuss further? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Is this something that we should have town halls and discussion groups about? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a great, great mm -hmm. opportunity. Okay. And I thank you and, and good, good work yes. in bringing this before us. Yeah. Uh, we are, I forgot to mention that we are right on the edge for being a community-wide low-mod income community. We, are at, we have to be over 51% and, and we are at 51.8%. And, uh, and HCD said, that's okay, uh, our statistics are based on two years back. So they're looking at 2015 data to determine whether or not our city is eligible. But, but the point is, pretty soon it's going to get a lot harder to use. You could use it for a senior nutrition program, or you could use it for a migrant uh, 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 family program, a special needs, such as those categories. Oh, um, sorts of things. But, it, but if you're going to work in the community hall where everyone can use it, then you need a, to have a citywide benefit. Right. Eligibility, citywide eligibility. Okay. 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 I'd like to share something with you before. Okay. <coughs> the, uh, the local LULAC uh, chapter in Hollister has. Uh, a grant from the national. They're setting up a, uh, I don't know what you call it, it's 10 computers. It, it's a tech. Uh, a tech, whatever. I don't know what the title is. It's a, it's a tech lab, and they've gotten them from AT&T, 10 computers, and they're going to be putting them in the community center at, uh, hmm. at uh, uh, Hollister. Yeah. So is that like a homework center or after school? After no, school, it, it's, it's going to be it's going to be open for to the public and, and basically for seniors and youth, uh, but it is open to the public. Is it going to be at the library or? It's going to be at the community okay, center. Community center. The one on three hundred West the on, on West, West Street, Street across on West Street. The, yes. okay, yeah. That. What's what uh, what Pauline did is that they had a, a conference room, yeah. and she donated because they didn't use it that much, so they're going to use a conference room. As a tech center. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I, I put in my data sage. We have no tech That's what I did too. I, <laughs> I, I asked them. Well, I, we need something. Well, I am and a it, cook in the organization. So well, so am I. <laughs> when did you go last? <laughs> anyway, what I was wondering, uh, John talking about uh, turning the community center into, you know, offices maybe. It, it, I don't know if we could take care of that acoustics problem, you know. But that's that's a really good idea, and maybe we could get some computers. Well, I think there's gonna be lots of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But your your proposition is let's start talking about it. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, because we're right. looking at a March mm -hmm. deadline, and there's some community outreach that needs to be done. So, so I just want to give the council a heads up. Okay. Good. good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good work. Thank you so much. Uh, comments, City Council. Anybody? Comments. I apologize for my coughing fits. <laughs> That's okay. Just I hope I don't get it. <laughs> well, I just want to thank everybody for your support for the last year. I, mean, I think we did real well. So thank you. Thank you you, you did a great, great job. job. You did a really good job. Thank, thank you. you. And my relationship with our city managers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> we uh, keep in constant contact. Yeah, I'm good. going to get into the road. Yeah, hey, you told me he's he, he a lot of resources in Rotary. People don't understand, but they're there. Yeah. He found out real quick. <laughs> okay. Any other council? Yeah. Okay. City manager? No, just get well and be well. Have a great holiday. Yeah. Good, thank you. City attorney? Just happy holidays to everybody. Okay, mm -hmm. Merry Christmas. Yes. Okay. Happy holidays. Second. So just a tag uh, of things, uh, EMC uh, do the uh, follow-up uh, ordinances uh, on all the things? I mean, is that a work Josh, item for them, or where is that, where are they going to come from? Thank you. Thank you, Dan.